Okay, so now we're going to focus on the user experience of Bitcoin. Uh, what's, what's it like to actually use it? How do you get Bitcoin in the first place? What kind of software do you use? That type of thing. So we've, we've spent a long time looking at kind of the back end and how the network works and the protocols and consensus and things like that. Now let's focus on uh, you. Let's say that you have uh, $20 in your pocket and you want to turn that into Bitcoin and, and start using it. What, what exactly, are, how are you going to do that? Okay. Um, so we'll call this the user experience. Okay, so let's say that you um, want to use Bitcoin. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to get a Bitcoin address somewhere where you can receive money. And uh, as we know, a Bitcoin address is the hash of your public key. And so you need to have the corresponding private key as well. Uh, otherwise, you, I mean, you can get an address without knowing the private key, then money will get sent to it and, and you won't be able to spend it. So you want to be able to spend the money, presumably, that you're receiving. So what you need is you're going to need some software that's going to generate a uh, key pair for you, a private key and a public key and, and a hash of your public key, which will be your Bitcoin address. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about the different options for a client in a second. Um, but, but for now, let's just note that you'll install a client uh, to obtain a key pair. and a Bitcoin address. Okay, uh, then the next thing you have to do is you're gonna to have to turn uh, your money into Bitcoin. Okay, so let's say that you have $20 and you wanna convert that into Bitcoin, which is BTC. How are you gonna do that? So the way you're gonna do it is um, you're going to use either, uh, well, first off, I'll, I'll note that the way that you do it is exactly the same. Uh, so we're in Canada here. So let's say this is $20 Canadian. I want to get 20 US dollars, right? Or, uh, or sorry, I want to get the equivalent in US dollars or in pounds or in euros or whatever, whatever currency it is. Um, it's basically going to be the same options for Bitcoin. You have to go to some sort of uh, exchange service or some, there's some service that's going to do this exchange for you, okay? And all kinds of exchanges, uh, you have two broad categories of how the exchange works. Um, uh, one set is called a broker, uh, and the other is called a dealer. Okay, so you can choose between them. Uh, there's broker services and dealer services in Bitcoin. Okay, so what's the difference? So a broker, you can think of, um, if the, the type of broker you're most likely to use is like say a real estate broker. Uh, the most, to, let's contrast that with a dealer. So let's say like a car dealer, okay? So it might seem that a real estate broker and a car dealer, they're kind of the same thing. One's, one's in houses and one's in cars, but other than that, they're exactly the same thing. But the fact that one's called a broker and one's called a dealer actually is a significant difference. What's the difference? So in a broker, uh, if you buy a house, uh, the broker's arranging the trade between the buyer and the seller. Uh, but the broker doesn't own the house. They're not selling you their house, right? All they're doing is they're serving as sort of a middleman uh, or a middle person. Um, so they're trying to arrange uh, that trade for you. Whereas if you go to a car dealer and you buy that car, even if it's a used car dealer, you're buying that car from the dealer themselves. Okay, that's the dealer's car. The dealer has that in their inventory. Okay, so you're buying it directly uh, from the dealer uh, themselves. Okay, so brokers um, arrange trades. Dealers will sell you from their own kind of private collection. Okay, uh, what's the differences uh, between them? Well, brokers... Um, first off, let, let's talk about a dealer. So a dealer will be a little faster, okay? Because they're selling you from their own inventory. They don't have to find you a matching counterparty. Um, uh, so dealers are, are fast. Uh, brokers are not necessarily fast. Depends, you know, it, it depends a lot on the broker and, and how much you're willing to pay, uh, that type of thing. Um, 
but it would be slower. Okay. Uh, and then think about the risk. So if the dealer goes and they buy a car, and let's say that car turns out to, to decrease in value or something like that, then they're on the hook, okay? Um, so they, they take on the risk of what they're dealing, okay? Uh, and as a consequence of risk, uh, they tend to have a higher fee. Whereas a broker, they don't care, right? They're, you know, if, the house, if houses go up or houses go down, it doesn't matter, right? It, it affects the seller, it affects the buyer, but it doesn't affect the broker. Um, so the broker is not exposed to any risk, okay? So they're kind of riskless. And so uh, they tend to, to, to not charge a fee that's going to insure them against the risk of what they're doing, okay? So basically you have a way that's kind of slow and uh, cheap and you have a way that's fast and expensive, okay? And that's like a lot of things in life, uh, you, you often get that choice, okay? Um, Okay, so let's talk about fine, or currency now. So a broker for Bitcoin is someone who's going to match buyers and sellers. Okay, so it's going to match buyers and sellers. And the most common way of doing a broker is a website um, called an exchange. So in Canada, it might be something like Kraken. Uh, you'll go, you'll create an account. Um, somehow you're going to have to move your $20 onto the exchange. Uh, you're going to do that with the traditional ba banking system. Uh, and how smooth that is depends on a lot of things. It depends on regulations in countries, and it depends on how willing bank accounts are, or uh, how cooperative they're going to be, um, that type of thing. Most countries, including Canada, will not let you buy Bitcoin or fund a broker account with uh, credit cards, uh, for example, um, because they view it as a risky asset, and generally you can't, you can't obtain those on credit. Um, but anyway, so there are ways, um, you know, it used to be sort of, you know, a little more crazy. Uh, you know, I remember in the early days of Bitcoin, you would have to, you know, kind of do these these uh, sort of weird deposits where uh, the exchange would receive the money, but they would have no idea what account it came from because the bank wasn't giving them that information. And so you'd have to like kind of encode a secret password into the, the most least significant bits of your transaction. So you might send, you know, whatever, a thousand dollars and fifty one cents and or a hundred and fifty one cents and that one five one was like an encoding of the fact that it was you as opposed to someone else who was sending money to the same exchange around the same time. Um, so it used to be really crazy. Now now there's a lot more regulation in, in place and, and exchanges have, have sort of worked out different ways with banks in order to, to, to make this go a little bit smoother. Uh, there still can be a lot of delays and fees and like those types of things on the banking side as opposed to the actual broker. But anyways, let's say you get your Canadian dollars, they're on the exchange website, um, then that's fine. Then they have a bunch of people who also have Bitcoin on their website and some people want to sell Bitcoin for money and some people want to sell money for Bitcoin and uh, you do it just like a traditional exchange service. Uh, there's what's called an order book where people put in offers and bids um, and, and it matches you as best as you can. Uh, we'll circle back to exchanges a little later uh, when we talk about applications because um, order books are one of the fintech solutions that in the fintech part of this course we'll, we'll look at uh, how you might implement them on a blockchain. But uh, let's just, we'll leave this for now. Um, Okay, so we have the exchange website and the most important thing with the exchange website is when your money is sitting on the exchange website, it's not sitting in your bank account. So the exchange owes it to you, but they own it. And same with your Bitcoin. So when your Bitcoin is on the exchange, on the exchange's website, uh, uh, they own uh, the Bitcoin. So they control the signing key that corresponds to the Bitcoin. Uh, it's just, it's owed to you. So they have a, a liability uh, to pay you that a much, um, but that's a legal liability, it's not a technical one. Okay, so it's owed to you. So it's owed to the users, but it's actually held in street name, as you might say. Okay, so that's an exchange website. Uh, and depending on what price you want, you can, basically it's, it's like a double-sided auction. So people will, offer Bitcoin for a certain price and other people will offer to buy Bitcoin at a certain price and when those prices overlap, then it gets executed. Um, so the amount of time it takes you depends on what you're willing to pay, right? If you're willing to pay what's on offer today, right away, that's called a market order, then it can be as fast as a dealer. 
Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's going to be slow. Okay. The other common way to get Bitcoin, especially in small amounts, uh, is in the dealer system, which is with an ATM. So an ATM is, is like a bank machine. Uh, so you will walk up to the bank machine. Um, generally, uh, for most of them, you'll deposit your Canadian dollars or whatever currency you have. And you'll give it your public key. So remember, we installed a client to obtain a key pair and a Bitcoin address. Usually the Bitcoin address, you know, you've seen what they look like. You could type it in. Um, often what it will do is it will give you a QR code, uh, which is kind of like a two dimensional barcode. And so what will happen is you'll have that on your phone or maybe you'll print it on a piece of paper or have a laptop or something like that. Um, and so you'll deposit your $20. Uh, the ATM is actually paying you from the ATMs. You know, it's not finding another ATM user who wants, you know, has Bitcoin and wants Canadian dollars and exchanging. It's on exchange, right? This is the ATM. So there's a company that's behind that. They own the Bitcoin. They're selling you the Bitcoin from their personal inventory. Um, so you'll deposit your $20 and uh, give it your key or your address uh, and it will send it. So it will send BTC to the address. Now there are two way ATMs where you can do the opposite. So you can walk up and it will have an address and you can deposit uh, Bitcoin from your phone or, or your computer. Um, and then it will spit out Canadian dollars. Um, so the mechanics of that are, are a little harder. It's harder to, to spit money out. You need a kind of more advanced ATM, um, but anyways. So these are your two basic options. And um, the, the main thing here are the fees. So ATMs tend to have very high fees. Um, and an exchange will have low fees. Uh, and the more you exchange, right, sort of the bigger your account, the more frequently you, you use it, they, they usually uh, carve off fees uh, even more if you, if you do a lot of volume uh, exchanging. So um, yeah, so anyways, these are, these are your two kind of basic options. Okay, so at this point you have your client, it's installed, uh, you have an address, uh, and you have some Bitcoin that's now sitting in your client. And the point is that, that notice that the ATM doesn't have to send the money to your, let's say your client's on your phone, it doesn't have to send the money to your phone, right? It's broadcasting it to a network. And then your phone is just going and checking the blockchain to see that the, the, the balance is, is increased, right? Or that the Bitcoin is sitting there. Um, so there's no direct communication other than you giving your public key or your Bitcoin address uh, over to the ATM. There's no direct communication uh, between these two devices. So that's that's kind of cool. Uh, for the exchange, they're going to hold on to your Bitcoin and then you can do a withdrawal. So you can say, hey, exchange service, here's my key, my client key, right, which, which corresponds to a key pair that's sitting on my computer. Uh, send the money to that. Uh, and then and then now you have control uh, over your own Bitcoin. So uh, technically the exchange isn't complete until you actually move the Bitcoin off the exchange website onto your own key. And we'll talk about reasons why you, a lot of users don't actually do that uh, because managing your own keys turns out to be a little bit problematic, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, um, so now, um, so you have, BTC in uh, software. Then it's just like normal software to use, okay? Uh, then you use it. Okay, so software could look like, uh, unfortunately on the computer that I'm recording this, I just have a really old uh, uh, client uh, that's that's no longer in use, so it's, it doesn't even connect uh, to the Bitcoin network. Um, but you can see that there are some uh, there is a client here. Uh, there's a bit of Bitcoin uh, sitting at this uh, at this wallet on this computer, and so anyway, this is what your interface looks like. Okay, uh, so what you can do is uh, first off, if, let's start with requests. So if I want to receive money, and by the way, if you really like these lectures, feel free to 
to drop me some Bitcoin. Um, but this is the address anyways that's sitting uh, on, the, on this wallet here, okay? And so there's a QR code as well that represents it. And if you really want to snoop around, you can go look this up on Block Explorer and see all the money that's gone in and out of this particular account. Um, but anyways, uh, so so that's um, that's how you would receive money. So I would I could text you uh, this particular address or email it to you or print it on my website or print it on a barcode. Uh, or if I walked up to an ATM and I put my $20 in, what I would do is I would scan this QR code and ask it uh, to, to deposit the money there, okay? Um, and then if I want to send it, what I'll do is I'll uh, type in someone else's address. Um, I'll type in, in the amount uh, that I want to send. I have to type in some passwords to unlock my key, so the keys tend to get wrapped in a password that's on your computer itself. I, I won't do that live. Um, but anyways, then you just click send and that's basically it. Um, it will show you that it's, uh, because I'm not connected to the network, it, it won't show you much in its current state, but, but it would show you that sort of the transaction's been sent, it's on the network in someone's mempool, uh, and then it's included in a block, which is called the first confirmation, and then you know it's in two blocks, three blocks, and then eventually when it's in six blocks, it's considered uh, fully confirmed. Now let's think about the wallet type. Um, so types of wallet. So I showed you an example of one type of wallet. Uh, it's it's only one uh, particular type, and there's there's really two dimensions to to sort of how we classify wallets. So we have uh, so a wallet is is the name for uh, sort of the the name that we tend to use for your client. And so uh, the first question is uh, actually has to do with the network, uh, how it connects to the network. And then the second question you're going to have to do is going to have to do with how does it protect the private key? Because there's some signing key uh, that can sign over your Bitcoin. Let's say you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, you're going to want to do something to make sure that you know that that you're protected. And so that actually tends to tends to be a, a kind of difficult problem. Um, so we'll, we'll think of key protection. Okay, um, so, so here we'll, I'll, I'll give you like, I don't know, five, uh, five or six different options here. Uh, none of them are perfect. Um, so we'll, we'll, not that, we'll sketch that in below. Um, but for the network, I, I wanna note before we get to key protection, um, if you remember from when we talked about what the network looks like in Bitcoin, uh, there's these nodes on the network. And one thing you can do is you can have a client, uh, so the standard Bitcoin client, which is called uh, Core, um, Bitcoin Core, it uh, uh, actually is a full node on the network, meaning that it joins the network just like it was a mining. In fact, in the original client, you could turn mining on right from the client itself. They, now it's a little more, um, a little more involved to turn money on, but but anyways, you're a full node in the in the network, so you're gonna you know receive copies of transactions, relay those transactions, and most importantly, you're gonna download the whole blockchain. And this is very significant because now the the blockchain is. I mean, by the time this is recorded, I have no idea how big it's going to be, but uh, depends when you listen to it, but. We're talking now at this point, sort of hundred. Think of of uh, hundreds of gigs of, of memory to download the blockchain. Now, once you download it, you can parse through it, and you're going to form your UTXO pool from it. So you don't have to keep it, but you do have to get it at least once to, to parse all the way through it. Uh, and so this tends to be problematic. Um, a, because it's just a huge download, and B, you're downloading it from a bunch of other nodes that are busy doing other Bitcoin-related things, and you know it, it, it's not like BitTorrent or something like that where it's serving, you know, the, the, the network's designed to serve you up this information. Um, speaking of BitTorrent, what you can do is, because there's one blockchain and everyone has the same copy, every now and then, every couple months, someone will upload the current blockchain to, say, BitTorrent, and it's a lot faster to just grab as much of it as you can from BitTorrent. It won't have the, the latest transactions, but then, then you can connect to the network and add up the transactions onto the end. Um, but anyways, downloading this, this blockchain, you know, you're talking about days. It could take days. You know? So if you want to use Bitcoin, you know, right now you're, you want to go stop watching this video and set up your Bitcoin account. Do you really want to wait two or three days? Uh, probably not. 
Um, so what you can do instead is there's this protocol. Uh, so it has a really fancy technical name, which is SPV, which is Simple Payment Verification uh, Protocol. Everyone just calls it uh, SPV. Uh, or uh, sometimes, actually, I shouldn't say everyone calls it, uh, that's the technical name, why don't we be non-technical? And, and these are usually called lightweight uh, clients. So that's a more accessible name for it. Okay, and here what you're going to do is, uh, you're not going to download the whole blockchain, you're going to connect to a server, and the server is going to download the blockchain for you, and it's just going to tell you about relevant transactions. Okay, so you'll get help. Uh, transactions. And th this server isn't anything fancy. It's it's actually just the full node. So when you run a full node, you can say, uh, hey, I'm willing to, to give lightweight nodes uh, transactions. And the really cool thing, I won't walk through this, but uh, let me just say it in words. The really, really cool thing about this is, of course, you have to trust this node to a certain extent. Um, Right, they can start lying to you about transactions, okay? Uh, but if they lie to you, and let's say that you're trying to put a transaction through and they're gonna lie to you, what you can do is you're not like totally stuck. You're not totally blind. What you can do is you can say, you know what, I'm not gonna download the whole blockchain, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna block, download the block headers for the blockchain. And the block headers, you know, that they're sort of real because they have, uh, they're really small numbers that are solutions to a proof of work problem, okay? So block headers aren't something you can just make up. You can't just manufacture them. For every block header, it is a hash of the previous block header. And even if you don't have all the information in the hash, you can check uh, that sort of chain. So you can think of, instead of downloading the, if you think of the blockchain itself as uh, you, you have the blockchain data structure. Um, so I said, I was just gonna say this in words, but let's, um, now that, that I'm sort of diving into it, let's let's draw it out. Um, so you have, remember, you have these sort of block headers and they include a hash uh, to the previous block headers. Plus, uh, they also contain a hash of the Merkle tree, uh, which extends uh, downward to a set of transactions. Okay, so each of these uh, has a Merkle root uh, and then a whole tree that's underneath it. Okay, and so the idea here is, let's say that um, that the node sees that this is a transaction you're interested in. It's a transaction that involves your key. What you can do is, instead of downloading all the data in the blockchain, what you can do is you can say, okay, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a copy of, of all just the block headers themselves. So that you can download no problem, not, not a big deal. Okay, so you're going to get a list of all the block headers. And then when the server comes along and says, hey, there's this transaction that's relevant to you, you can say, okay, you know what, I don't want all the data, but why don't you send me the path of that transaction in the Merkle tree? And I can hash it all the way up and see that it's in this Merkle root. I can see this Merkle root is in this header. I can see a couple blocks have been added onto the end of where this transaction is. And I know it would take about 10 minutes to add this block. And I know it would take another 10 minutes to add this block. And maybe there's a whole bunch of, by the time you hear about it, maybe there's there's you know six or seven blocks on the end. And so you're sitting there thinking, this, this node's probably not lying to me because if they're lying to me, it's true, they could just make up this transaction, put it in, uh, and the, but they would have to do a proof of work for every single one of these things. And they're not as fast as the network, right? It's taking the network 10 minutes to do these, but they're just one node on the network. So what takes the network 10 minutes might take them an hour, two hours a day, something like that. And so they would have to put a lot of work into to faking uh, the inclusion of a particular transaction, okay? So the nice thing about this SPV protocol is that, um, uh, transactions, fake transactions basically can't be included. Okay, so fake transactions can't be included.
Okay, so it can't lie to you in that sense. Now, one thing it could do is, let's say this does involve your key and just says, oh, I didn't see anything that happened that involved your key. Okay, so it excludes transactions. That you can't do anything about, okay? So it can't make up transactions, um, uh, but an SPV node can uh, exclude transactions. So this is SPV node. Uh, we'll call it the trust model. And so we call it a semi-trusted node. And the other thing is, I mean, there's, there's not a big incentive for it to lie to you anyways. Um, so in general, you can use these lightweight clients and almost everyone does. So even the client I showed you that's on my computer, it actually happens to be an SPV client. Uh, the other thing I'll note too is that, you know, I, I did kind of give you this mental model of using your computer for your client. And then we talked about, you know, downloading the blockchain and it taking you three days and using up 100 gigs or whatever uh, the size might happen to be by the time you watch this video. But imagine doing that on your phone, right? You're not going to do that on your phone. You have way less memory on your phone. Um, you know, it's not going to download for three days straight. Um, you know, if, if you're not on Wi-Fi, it's going to eat up your data costs. And so basically it's a no-go on, on a mobile device. Um, so SPV is used on all mobile devices. And if it's good enough for your phone, why not just use it on your computer? That's, that's the mentality of, of a lot of people. So lots and lots of people run SPV clients, uh, even if they have a full-fledged computer. Um, now, there, there are sort of people who, who try and encourage you to use a full node because you're contributing to the network uh, and you're helping make the network better by relaying transactions and validating all the transactions that you see. So you're kind of adding security to the network as well. So um, in an ideal world, everyone would run a, a full node, but in a, a realistic world, a bunch of people are going to run uh, lightweight nodes. Okay, now let's uh, move on to key protection. Okay, so let's say you're a Bitcoin millionaire. Uh, that means that you have some Bitcoin address or a set of addresses that contain um, uh, that contain a bunch of, of Bitcoin that adds up to a million dollars. So that's great. Congratulations. How are you going to say? How are you going to protect this? Okay, and right off the bat, I want to note that um, this is a key, and if you lose your key, there's no way to recover it. Right? It's not like a password where there's somebody who set the password for you, and if you forget it, you can go and reset that password. Okay, so if you lose key, if you lose your key, you've lost your million dollars. Now, on the the flip side, if someone else gains access to your key, they can move the money. And the thing about Bitcoin is because it's just a network, and there's no one in charge. It's not run by a government. It's not run by a bank. There's no way, and we've seen that the blockchain has these these properties where. Uh, there's a consensus around a single blockchain, okay? Uh, consensus around a single blockchain implies that it's immutable, uh, meaning that it won't change. Once a transaction is included and, and it's sort of well incorporated in the block, it's there for good, right? The consensus will always go that way, unless if you can get 51% of the network to agree to remove a transaction. And this has actually happened in really extreme uh, circumstances, like the number of times, you know, I can count on, on one hand, uh, that this has happened on a major cryptocurrency like like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but but anyways, basically, you know, you know, if you lose your key, you're done. Okay, um, so securing your key ends up being a really hard problem, and it's a problem that I don't think we even have a good solution for. Uh, different people, there's about ten different things that have been proposed, and different people will do it different ways depending on um, how technical they want to be and 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 certain little trade offs uh, that they might make. Uh, between ease of use, security, um, how fast they want their funds, uh, those, those types of things. So let me give you a bit of a lay of a land of, of what your options are. So by default, if you just install, like say a basic wallet on your phone or on your computer, uh, what will happen is your signing key, your private key, uh, will be in a file, uh, which is on your computer or your device. 
And uh, the common file for, for Bitcoin Core is called wallet.dat. Okay, so you can go into your directory and you can find that file. Uh, and they, they don't try to hide it, right? There's no point in hiding it because people will figure out where it is. And uh, because you might want to back it up, uh, they actually make it fairly accessible. Uh, so wallet.dat is, uh, for example, uh, what the file might be called. Okay, and if you lose this file, you lose your money. Okay, um, so the the pros and cons of this is uh, well, what I just said. So if you lost, uh, you know, if, if file is gone, uh, all your money, your Bitcoin is gone too. And the other thing is, so you might say, well, let's let's make this file as sort of hard to find as as or sorry, as easy to find as possible, right? We don't want to lose it, so let's make lots of copies of it and maybe we'll put it on lots of different devices and things like that. But if you if you go overboard in, in making this accessible, right, you put it up in Dropbox, whatever the case may be, there's also a chance that it gets stolen. And by stolen, I mean someone else gets access to it, okay? So you want to make it as accessible to you that you're not going to lose it, but not so accessible that other people have access to it uh, because if it's stolen, then your Bitcoin's gone as well. Okay, so if, if file is read by uh, the adversary, then your Bitcoin's gone anyways. Okay, malware today, uh, you can get, it's not uncommon for, for typical malware to actually look, look in common directories for exactly this file. Uh, there's enough Bitcoin in the world that uh, that's one thing that malware will do. Um, so this is not science fiction. Uh, people will go, you know, you can get malware on your computer and it's going to go look uh, for this particular file. Okay. Um, so this led people to uh, augment it at least a little bit, uh, which is uh, you can have a basic wallet uh, plus password protection. So in this case, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, uh, save signing key in wallet.dat and uh, password protect it. What does it mean to password protect? I mean, you get the intuition since this is a crypto course. Usually what you're doing is you're taking your password, you're converting it into a key uh, using something called a key derivation function, which we will talk about in a second because uh, that's a, a, a different way of doing this. Um, but anyways, you sort of expand your password into a key. It doesn't add anything in terms of, of strength to your password. It just turns it into one from one format into another format. Um, and then once it's done that, then you encrypt uh, the file uh, using that password as a key, and if you want to decrypt it, you'll uh, you'll just come along with your password. It will convert it into the decryption key, and then it will try and decrypt the file for you. Okay, um, so uh, so what's the the advantage? Well, the advantage here is that uh, if you get malware, it can steal wallet.dat, but it doesn't know your password. Okay, it can try and crack your password. Um, so how strong this is depends on on how good of a password you use. Okay, um, so in terms of your ability to get stolen, it's harder, okay? So it's harder to steal, okay? Because you have to steal both, you need both. If you have the password but not the file, uh, or if you have the file and not the password, then you can't do anything or you'd have to spend a lot of time uh, trying to find the other one. Okay, but there's this basic trade-off uh, that you know, it's, it's not necessarily the case, but generally things that are harder to steal are easier to lose. Okay, so it's so if you want to steal it, you have to steal both the wallet and the password. If you want to lose it, you only have to lose one of them. If you lose your wallet, you lose your Bitcoin, you know, even if you know your password. And if you lose your password without losing your wallet, um, then you also are out of luck. Okay, so you, so you can lose either wallet.dat or password. And you're done, okay? 
the other problem with this uh, type of approach is, um, so, so first off, I'll, I'll note, let me note something a, a little bit uh, more general. So when we talk about authentication in general, we uh, sometimes we'll break it into three categories, something you have, something you know, and something you are. So something you have is like a file. Okay, it's, it's not something you know, you haven't memorized it, it's something you have. You have it on your hard drive and you have your hard drive in your bag. Uh, something you know is like a password, it's in your head, okay? Um, and something you are is, is something like a biometric, like a fingerprint or something like that, okay? Um, and so uh, w this is nice because this is, uh, so sometimes we call, you know, you've heard the term probably two-factor authentication. Technically two-factor means that it's not two things that you have or two things you know, it's, it's one of each, okay? So like a, a file plus a password is two-factor authentication because it's something you know, the file, sorry, it's something you have, the file, and something you know, the password, okay? So it mixes those two factors. And you could certainly use a fingerprint instead if your laptop has a fingerprint reader or you're on your phone or something like that, um, you could uh, fingerprint lock, um, you know, wallet.dat, or you could use all three. You could have three factor where you have um, a file that's protected by a password and maybe the password's in your keychain and, and your keychain's protected by your fingerprint or face ID on, on Apple or something like that. Um, so th there's lots of different configurations here, but they all have the same property, which is that uh, they make them harder to steal because you have to steal all the factors, but they make them easier to lose because you just have to lose one of one of the two or three factors and then and then you've lost the whole thing, okay? Um, the other problem with it is sometimes, uh, you know, when you think about usability, you have to think about the user's mental model of the software. So I'm telling you how this works under the covers. I'm telling you the keys saved in this file and then the password is used to protect this file. So I'm telling you that, okay? But when you use the software, the software is not necessarily telling you that. Okay, so you might, you know, install your software and it might say, great, um, you know, give me a password. And you'll be like, okay, you set a password, right? And then what you might do is you might decide, oh, I want a new laptop. And so you install your client on your new laptop and then you install Bitcoin and then you type your password in and all of a sudden, you know, your money's not there, right? Because the password's using to protect the file, but the software, because you're so used to passwords, it's, it doesn't tell you that the password's being used to protect the file. And so you think that the password is what's protecting your Bitcoin, okay? So it's important as well that the software communicates to the user the right mental model of what's going on. Um, okay, so um, it's, it's easy uh, for users to get the wrong uh, mental model here. Okay, now the next thing you can do is um, notice that we did this little trick. We said, okay, if we think about this mental model, um, basically if you sit down on a new computer, you need both wallet.dat and you need your password, okay? But the user is expecting that once they set a password that that's sort of what controls it. So is there any way that we can actually set up a wallet where you just need a password, okay? Uh, that, that would be great. So there's one way you can do it. Uh, and notice that we've already seen the trick. So here what we said is, if you wanna protect password, protect this file, what you're gonna do is you're gonna convert your password into a key and you're gonna use the key to encrypt wallet.dat. But what's inside wallet.dat? Well, what's inside wallet.dat is another key. So you're taking your password, turning it into a key that you're using to encrypt another key. Why don't you just turn your password into the key that you're trying to protect in the first place? Okay, uh, so that's, that's a, a sensible option. Um, so these are, are sometimes called brain wallets um, because uh, everything you need to create this wallet uh, is in your brain. Um, so it's, it's something you know, there's no something you have at all. And so the idea with a brain wallet is uh, you'll take a password 
you'll run it through a little function uh, which will turn it into uh, a signing key or a Bitcoin private key. Or a set of keys, whatever. It doesn't, you know, how you do this exactly doesn't really matter. Uh, these are sometimes called KDF, key uh, derivation functions. Uh, we saw them earlier uh, when we talked about hash functions. Uh, where we mentioned you might hash something a thousand times. That was that was the idea of a KDF. Okay. Um, okay. Now notice that your signing key is only as good as your password. Okay. So your signing key, or put it a different way, it can be guessed. So normally a key is too big to be guessed. But in this case, instead of trying to guess the key, what I'll do is I'll try and guess a password. So I'll guess a password, run it through KDF, and then try that key. Then I'll try another password, run it through KDF, and try another key. Okay, so signing key can be guessed uh, via guessing the password. Okay, and so as a result, user chosen passwords are too weak, generally speaking. I mean, it depends on the user, uh, but lots of people were choosing really bad passwords. And the thing about it is uh, once you receive money, the public key is, uh, so, so remember, um, you know, if you wanna uh, use this actual signing key to receive Bitcoin, what you'll do is you'll take your signing key, you'll run it through the key gen of ECDSA, uh, you'll turn it into a public key. Uh, let me do this in another color because I just want to emphasize that this is kind of off on the side, a little bit of a tangent here. Uh, so if you take your signing key, uh, you run it through key gen, right? Then you get your public key, right? And from your public key, you can hash it and you can get your address. And once you use your address, so you receive money at it, um, then it's on the blockchain, okay? So what people can do is they can go through the blockchain and they can say, okay, I have this address here. And what they can do is they can go all the way back to the password. And what they'll do is they'll try a common password like dog. They'll run it through the KDF, they'll get a signing key, they'll run it through keygen, get a public key, they'll run it through a hash, they'll get a Bitcoin address. Then what they'll do is they'll scrape the entire blockchain and see, hey, is there any, um, you know, is there any addresses that have dog as their password? And if there is, they'll steal the money, right? Then they'll start again with another common password, okay? And they'll go through this whole process. And so you can build up this sort of dictionary or rainbow table of passwords converted into addresses. Uh, and then what you can do is you can go on the Bitcoin blockchain and, and try and find uh, things. And so there's evidence of this happening. People have published uh, these, these core, you know, password address pairs uh, and then if you go in the blockchain, because every transaction is public, you can see money, you know, sort of being drained out of these accounts. Um, now, you're, you're never sure that it's being stolen as opposed to um, as opposed to the owner actually moving it. But um, anyways, you, you can there's a lot of evidence that suggests that that's exactly what's happening. Um, OK, so these brain wallets with user chosen passwords, really, really bad idea. Uh, but what you could do instead, and, and almost all software does this now, is you can do a machine chosen or a random randomly chosen password and so what it will do is uh it will choose a password for you at random and then it will give you it and they'll say hey go print this out or memorize it or do whatever you want uh and this will, they, they pitch it more as a backup. So they're like, if you ever lose your key, you ever lose wallet dot dot, no problem. Just remember this kind of password that we chose for you. And if you can type that back in, uh, then you can recover your account. Uh, so it's, it's used to recover, or that's how it's framed. But at the end of the day, it's actually just, it, it is a brain wallet with a machine chosen password. It's, it's no different than that, okay? Um, so this is, you know, it's called recovery. Uh, and most commonly, instead of having like weird characters, what they'll do is they'll give you a bunch of words, like 10 words, and each word is drawn randomly from the dictionary. So you have a dictionary of, 
you know, thousands of words. You pick one at random, you pick another one at random. And so anyways, it's and, and then they, they tend to be kind of simple words and they're sort of easy to type in. Uh, it's still kind of too complicated to memorize. But um, but but anyways, yeah, so these are called recovery words sometimes. OK, and that's that's what your your client will do uh, for you. Um, so, so brain wallets uh, usually have a bad name because they're they're kind of sim synonymous with uh, user chosen passwords, um, but machine chosen passwords are are kind of using the same thing. Um, okay. Now, there's another way to get a password kind of experience, and that is don't maintain the wallet yourself. So what we noted is actually if we go way, way back, we said you have $20 in your pocket, you want to get some Bitcoin. One of the options is you can go to this exchange website, then they own the Bitcoin, but they owe it to you. So the exchange service in this case, they're kind of acting like a bank. You move your Bitcoin onto the exchange service uh, and then the exchange service just gives you a username password to log in. And if you lose uh, your password, no problem. You just you know send an email uh, or you recover your password you know, through your email uh, that you have registered and it works just kind of like an online bank. Okay, and because they own the Bitcoin, they're the ones that are maintaining that wallet.dat file. Okay, so it's not your problem anymore. Now, the, the what is your problem is if the exchange service gets hacked, uh, which does happen also in real life uh, because exchange services tend to have a lot of Bitcoin and it's a really nice target for, for hackers because if they can breach the servers and, and, and steal that Bitcoin, it's as simple as stealing keys um, so it's small data that you have to steal. And once you've stolen it, because Bitcoin has this sort of immutability, uh, you can move it and it's not traceable and it's not, or it's hard to trace and it's, um, it's hard for the transaction to be reversed. There's no bank or government that's gonna reverse that transaction for you. Um, so, so anyway, th these are the pros and cons of using uh, what's called a web hosted wallet or just a hosted wallet or an exchange as a, as a sort of example of a hosted wallet. So in this case, a web service holds uh, the signing key for you. And it gives you a web interface. So if you want to send Bitcoin, you just sort of log in and then you just fill in the information. I want to send it from this place to this place and then it will do it and it will, you know, decrease your balance or whatever the case may be. Okay, so in this case, you trust the web service fully. And there are a few models that are kind of in between where you kind of have a web service, but then you have some offline information and um, there, there's different configurations. But anyways, the simplest is that you, you trust the web service completely. So if they lose your, your Bitcoin, you're done. Uh, the biggest uh, web wallet was an exchange service called Mt. Gox that, that was actually breached. Uh, they lost uh, the equivalent of 450 million US dollars worth of Bitcoin uh, when that was breached. Uh, so it does happen and, and people lose money. and so. Um, most Bitcoin enthusiasts are going to tell you never do this. Okay, never do the web hosted wallet because you're you're giving uh, all your Bitcoin over to a, another party. But honestly, I mean, if my parents came to me and said I want to hold Bitcoin, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to try and talk them into to maintaining a wallet on their computer. I mean, it's just the usability is is too it's too hard. It's too easy for them to, you know, get get some malware that's going to steal it or you know, lose access to it, you know, forget your laptop on a, a plane or something like that and, and all your Bitcoin's gone. And so uh, from a usability perspective, actually web hosted wallets are, are really nice. Uh, and so anyways, we we as research, as a research community have to do a better job of, of, of sort of trying to come up with solutions that have a, a better balance of, of usability and security. But anyway, so you can trust the web service uh, completely. Um, sorry, you, you have to do that. And uh, the benefit is that uh, you can reset your password if you lose it. And you can access it from anywhere. So you can sit down at a new computer uh, and you can access it. You have to be careful where, where you're typing your, your password into. Um, but it's uh, nice and portable uh, in addition. 
Okay. Uh, there's a few other uh, options I'll, I'll just mention uh, sort of briefly. Um, so one thing you might do is whether it's your primary, so these are all wallets and a wallet is basically a collection of two things. One is it has the key itself and it has the ability to transact, okay? What you might do is, especially if you're just going to sit on your Bitcoin, you have a million Bitcoin dollars and you just want to kind of keep the key, but you don't want to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Then you can look at, is there a way that I can kind of store my key somewhere uh, more in a backup format as opposed to, to an active format as well? Um, so there's one thing you can do is just print it out on paper. Uh, so these are called paper wallets. Um, so this is a, you can think of it as a key backup. Another thing you might do is put it on a USB stick, put a USB stick in a uh, safety deposit box. Now they have special USB sticks that, that have the wallet functionality as well. So you just walk up to your computer, you sort of plug it in. Um, there's some authentication uh, on the device as well. Uh, there's some, you know, special hardware that makes it hard for someone who gets physical possession to extract the key without knowing the authentication details. Um, so these are called hardware security uh, modules or hardware tokens. Uh, there, there's a whole set of these. They're basically kind of like secure USB sticks. They do a little bit more, uh, but that's how we'll, we'll leave it just for the sake of the notes. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, you might have a computer, uh, you might have your Bitcoin sitting on a computer that you never connect to the internet. So there's no chance that it's going to get infected. Well, there's, I shouldn't say there's no chance, but at least that's, it eliminates one of the major vectors that you would get that computer infected. Uh, and so what you can do is you can kind of have one computer that's online and you can have another computer that's offline. All your Bitcoin keys are on the offline computer and then when you want to send money, you kind of move them from one computer to the other using some mechanism like QR codes or maybe a USB stick. Of course, malware could infect a USB stick. But um, uh, so this is called an air gap uh, as well. And so some wallets, uh, like there, there was one called Armory, at, don't know if it's still actively developed, but uh, it, it would set up this, you know, it would give you the different wallets to install on your different devices, including online and offline uh, pair of devices. The other thing, let me go back to paper wallets. So paper wallets are nice in one sense because you know, we talked about, you know, giving the user the right mental model. And so a paper wallet gives you a really nice uh, mental model because it's the same as cash. We're all used to carrying around cash, okay? And so if you can store your cash securely, presumably you can store a paper wallet uh, securely, okay? So it gives you this sort of mental model of cash. But there's one key difference. So a paper wallet will have your private key printed out on it, usually in like a QR code or something like that. And the key difference is that if anyone sees that QR code, not steals it from you, but just sees it, they can steal your money. So with cash, you know, if you walk around with cash in plain view and say you walk past security cameras and they see a picture of the cash as you're carrying around, they can't steal that cash from you. Okay, but with a paper wallet, they can literally. You know, there was one example that I like where uh, someone went on TV, they went on national TV and, um, you know, they were talking about Bitcoin. And so they gave the TV host a paper wallet uh, with, it didn't have a lot of Bitcoin on it. Uh, but anyway, the TV host was kind of like, oh, this is cool and held it up to the camera, right? And so someone was at home and they just kind of paused their TV stream, backed it up uh, to where the QR code was. They pointed, uh, you know, their phone at the TV, uh, they captured the QR code and then stole the money. Okay, and all of that happened in, you know, within seconds, at least that transaction was launched within seconds of, of it appearing on live TV. Okay, and the money was gone. And then they tweeted at the, the host and said, oh, I got your Bitcoin and sort of explained how it happened and offered to give it back. And I think the host said, just keep it or whatever. But uh, anyway, so the, the mental model of cash uh, is, is, it's close, but not exactly correct. And it could lead to um, uh, dangerous errors, uh, if, if you think of it exactly like cash. Okay. 
Okay. Now, there's one other thing I want to talk about uh, in terms of com uh, in terms of usability. And okay, so there's one other mental model that you have probably of how the software works that's not correct that I want to I want to sort of explain. Uh, the mental model you have is you turn your client on, it generates a private key for you, and um, let's say that you're going to keep it in a file with that's password protected, that's that's great. Uh, but you also want to make a backup just in case something happens. So maybe you're going to put it on a USB stick and, and put this USB safe, stick somewhere safe. Okay, then, it, then if you ever lose your computer, um, then you're fine. Okay, now what happens is that uh, what your computer does is it actually doesn't generate a single key. Okay, so the wallet looks like it generates a single key or key pair. So a public key and private key or, or a Bitcoin address and, and private signing key. Okay, but what it really does is it creates a pool of keys. Uh, so I, I forget where we're at in terms of it, but let's call it 100 keys, okay? And then, I don't know if you remember it, but back when we looked at Bitcoin transactions, uh, when we looked at the detail structure of a transaction, you saw that there was a bunch of Bitcoin coming in and it was all coming in from different keys. Uh, and then it was being sent to also a different key. Uh, and one of that transactions looked like change. It was change that was supposed to go back to the original sender, but it was going to a different key than any of the keys that were, were being input into the transaction. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that wallets will generate like 100 keys, and then you'll receive money at the first key, and then when you send it, you'll send it to whoever you're sending it, and then the change will come back to a different key. It will generate a fresh key, or more precisely, it will choose a fresh key from this pool of 100 keys, okay? And then when you send money, uh, first off, when you look at the client, it looks like all your money's sitting at that one key. It doesn't show you that there's actually 100 keys sort of under the covers. Um, and so what happens is that, that you keep rotating through keys. And the reason they're doing that is because every Bitcoin transaction is recorded on the blockchain. And so it leaks a lot of information. We'll talk about anonymity uh, in a bit, but um, the blockchain, you know, it is a, a data structure that leaks a lot, of, a lot of information, okay? So in order to, it was thought that in order to increase anonymity, it would be good to kind of rotate through your keys. So the problem is, what can happen is when you make your backup, you could back up your you know, 100 keys that, that are in your current key pool. But then what will happen is you'll use your Bitcoin client and you'll do a couple hundred transactions and eventually you're going to run out of new keys. And so then your client will be like, okay, no problem. We'll generate a whole bunch more keys, right? They're basically free to generate. Um, so, well, they are free to generate. There's just this slight computational cost. Um, and so they'll generate a whole bunch of new keys. Okay, now let's say that, that you've done this and now you've lost your computer and then you go and you put your USB uh, stick back up, you know, and you try and restore from that. Well, it has the original pool of the 100 private keys, but it doesn't have any of the new ones. And so all the money that, that all the change that you've received since you've exhausted, um, since you've churned through the original 100 keys, that money's gone. Okay, so this is another example of, you know, mental models are really, really important, right? When you, when you try and simplify things too much for users, um, users won't make the right decisions about what they have to do. But if you give them too much detail, then that can be hard too. And so you get into this, this sort of trade-off uh, that, that's, that's very, very difficult. Now, if we go back to this brain wallet idea, especially with the machine chosen password, in this case, what will happen is um, they won't just generate a single key. What they'll do is they'll generate kind of like a seed that generates all the keys. And once you run out of your 100 keys, then it will use that seed to generate the next 100, next 100, next 100. So as long as you can remember the recovery words, you can recover the seed. And as long as you can recover the seed, you can, you can recover all the addresses, not just the ones that were happened to be generated the first time you used it. Um, so anyway, so that's a, that's a very proper way of doing it. And so this is a problem that's, that's kind of solved uh, but but it depends a lot on, on what particular wallet uh, you use, okay? Um, so let me just jot a few notes about this uh, down and then we'll uh, move on to the next topic.
So if you churn through all the keys, then your backup kind of becomes out of date. Uh, it's sort of obsolete. It doesn't have the newest, the newest set of keys. Okay, so that's just another kind of random usability issue that you have to care about.